as she comes out, she's a, a tall woman. She's taller than me. And she goes, I'll bet you're a nervous wreck. And she takes me in a big bear hug and kind of shakes me up and down. She oh goes, my I'm sure you're nervous. Don't be nervous. It's This is going to be fun. Hi, everyone. Welcome to They Had Fun. I'm Rachel, and I am back with another amazing story about New York City. But up first, we are going to have my Rachel's Rex. Those are my personal recommendations of things you can get into this week in the city. And after that, we will hear from my fabulous guest who is a New Yorker. I also just wanted to mention this week happened to be my 18-year anniversary in New York City. And every year this sort of creeps up on me. We always celebrate it, typically doing something fun, but I don't know, this year really stuck out in my head. It's been 18 years. And so my husband and I went out and got a martini at the Odeon, sat at the bar and just sort of discussed everything. And I kind of just can't believe how long it's been and that somehow I made all of this work out. And I know Many of you listeners of the podcast will ask me about, you know, my answers to the questions. What's the most fun I've ever had? When did I come here? And I always say the same thing. So why don't I just speak it into existence onto the airwaves now that I have this whole dream in my head that one day I will be a guest on the show where I tell you all of the answers to these questions. And that day will come when Sarah Jessica Parker decides to be my guest host. This is what I think about. I would love to have her on the show. You know, she's just... Listen, am I obsessed with Sex in the City? Of course, but really it's about her being absolutely, utterly obsessed with New York City. She is just one, there's a few handful of those people. It's like Spike Lee and Ed Burns and Andy Cohen and Padma Lakshmi. I don't know, there's like certain people that you can just tell from their personas they put out there just obsessed with the city and someone like her I think would be a great guest. So I don't know, if you're listening to this and you know her, pitch this podcast to her. Tell her I'd love to have her interview me. But yeah, 18 years in New York, crazy to think about how fast that went by and that somehow like didn't all fall to shit. It actually worked out. All right, got the sentimental part out of the way. Let's get into my recommendations. These are two things I am so obsessed with right now. And you know, I bring you guys the things that I'm actually obsessed with. Okay, number one, it is the European-esque elevated bike lane on Flushing Avenue that goes through the Navy Yard. Now, Obviously, you guys know I'm obsessed with biking in the city, city bike, all of that stuff. City bike still trying to get their sponsorship of a new series. Also come at me for that one if you know somebody at city bike. But I have been loving riding this bike lane on Flushing Avenue. I don't even know where it starts, right at like the BQE and it goes all the way past Wegmans, which is basically in Dumbo. I forget the street. But most importantly, this bike lane is like elevated and it goes both directions and it's like three feet away from the cars and it truly feels like you are in Copenhagen or Paris. It feels super safe. It feels kind of like luxurious and beautiful. I I mean, I can't put it any other way. It feels like when you're biking in one of those cities where they actually care about their cyclists and about cars not killing them. It is such a fun ride. When I do it on a city bike, I have a little basket and I put my things in the front. I'm loving that. If you enjoy biking, truly, honestly, even if it's like not on your route or you don't have a plan, go ride this bike lane. It has been such an enjoyable experience for me recently. I've been going out of the way just to use it. Cannot recommend the Flushing Avenue elevated bike lane enough. I don't know. Maybe it has some sort of title I don't know about, but that's what I'm calling it. Okay, next up is this app that my husband introduced me to. I know this sounds so ridiculous. Like, Here's an app you can use, but it's called Subway Time. So if you're a New Yorker, maybe you're like me, plotting out getting to the subway, at the right time is a huge part of everything. And there's always all these different apps. I have an MTA app. I have this one called Next Stop. I have all these different things. But I have found this one to be so user-friendly and so accurate, it is changing my approach to my subway. I don't know. I'm like an eight to 10 minute walk from my subway. So this is super helpful for me. And one of the best things you can do is you can make a little widget for your iPhone, either on like your dock screen that you slide to or on your main screen. And you can favorite any line that you want. And you can see the next four arriving trains. Like, like, what? The, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe something like this has already existed and no one ever told me about it, but I'm trying to tell you guys about this one. It's called Subway Time. I have the widget. I can now walk out my door and see, oh, there's one coming in two minutes and there's one coming in nine minutes. I'm not going to make the two minute. I'm going to go straight for the nine. Mi- it's just, I am loving it. And you can add all different ones. So like I do a lot of transfers at Union Square, added a widget just for the Union Square ones. So I can see which trains are coming. Subway Time, really, really loving it. Guys, that's two, no food, no restaurant, no bar. You know, I feel I feel pretty good when I get those in there. We have to remember there's all sorts of things in New York City that can make our life great, including an elevated bike lane and a nerdy little app. Okay, 
With that being said, let's go ahead and get into my guest for this week. You guys know the drill. The resume is impressive and long. So let's go ahead and get into it. First up, he is a lapsed actor. He is the organizer of Mark's Fest right in Brooklyn, New York. He also happens to run a 24-7, 365 radio station called Clad Right. He is a humorist. He's an author of a book, What Doesn't He Do? I can't wait to talk about some of these. Please welcome to the show, Brett Leverage. Hi, Rachel. So great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being on. I am obsessed with your intro. I love that there are so <laughs> many titles. I mean, it's just the pinnacle of being a New Yorker that, of course, you have a full-time regular job, but you have all of these passion, all of these interests. You know, we've got a book, we've got Mark's Fest. I feel like, as we were talking before, so many avenues we can go down. And I guess I maybe that's lazy as a host to be like, which one do you want to talk about? <laughs> I kind of feel like, you know, we always give this first little you know, a little bit of the show to talk about the guests, maybe how we met, what they're into. So I think with a resume like this, I can leave it completely open to you if you want to say, this is the one that I want to talk about right now. Well, we could talk a little bit about Clad Right Radio since you mentioned that. Yes. It's a streaming radio station that is free to listen for anyone. And it features music of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. I started this station, I think about 14 years ago. I'd have to go check my notes, but something like that. Oh, wow. And it's still going strong. I have listeners all over the world. And, it, you know, it's a it's a niche station. First of all, it's a labor of love. It's not, not a moneymaker, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a delight for me. And, you know, it's a one-man operation. I'm revealing that here. It's funny, as I've promoted it from the very beginning, as I promoted it on social and various places, it was always we this and we that. I just thought early on, if it, if it sounds like a group effort, it'll be more impressive. People will take it more seriously because it's a, it's a group of people working on this. But in truth, and I'm revealing this here for the first time, <laughs> that it's just me. I am the we of, of Clad Right Radio. I'm really getting the inside scoop here. And I have to say, you are. I kind of have the same problem or you know when I started they had fun it also sounds disingenuous when you talk about a subject matter especially something all encompassing like this radio or whatever you when you just keep saying like and now I'm doing that it like it feels like it needs a we and even sometimes I'll go back and forth when I write like newsletters or talk on the show I'll say we do this like as they had fun as an entity but it's obviously just me and I'm doing <laughs> it's just so, well, not so obviously because you do a great job people might not know it's just you <laughs> But now we know. So okay. we may want to edit this section out later for both of them. <laughs> but for now, it's out there. We're both finally living our truth. It's just us yes. doing all this. I mean, to me, the thing that's most interesting about doing this radio, I'm a fan of that type of music. I grew up with that with my grandparents. It's some of my favorite music to listen to. And I think preserving these things is what is interesting to me. We don't get lost in wide-eyed optimism of what the past used to be and, and things, but you can still enjoy it. And be a fan of it and preserve it. And I think, you know, a little bit, that's kind of what I like to do here. Mine is just New York City. And I want to hear those stories and not forget about the times. And yes, the future is exciting as well. But like, what about all the, the different layers? So I think that's important that you love this music so much and you're finding a way to preserve it for other people. Yeah, that's the idea. You know, and it's funny, you, you mentioned idealizing the past. Yeah. I have a lot of social media platforms and I make two-minute tribute videos to actors mostly, but also some musicians of the past. They're usually titled 10 Things You Should Know About Whomever. And it's just a quick rundown of the life and career. And in the comments, I'll often see someone saying, oh, she was a wonderful actress, not like these untalented actresses you see today. And I mean, I just can't stand that attitude. I hate it. <laughs> we're, we're celebrating the past, but you don't have to trash the future to appreciate what was. Because when they talk about, oh, it was better than, or it was simpler than, or whatever someone might say about the past, mm -hmm. what's well, simply not true for women and for people of color and for gay men and women? It was rough then. Yeah. So I just can't, I can't glamorize or idealize the past, but you know, I love the pop culture of the past. Yeah. You can be a fan of the art. I mean, I agree with you. Lord, two peas in a pod with this idea is this romanticizing of times past where it's like, you know, I have an entire uh, sixth season of a podcast to say like it's all still it's still happening so I feel the same way we can love all of the times and the great art and the everything whether it's New York or the music or whatever our passions are but there are great things that happen then that we can all learn from and love and there are things now that are just as wonderful 
we have the same opinion on that. Okay, so we had about nine things in the intro to choose from. We've just touched <laughs> on one of them, but people get need to learn all sorts of, we've put links to everything that you do, including Mark's Fest and your book and, and all of these things. So we started with that. Now that we know that you have all these passions, which is what makes up a great New Yorker, why don't we get into the normal questions of the show? And of course, the first one is, when did you move to New York? I moved to New York in 1982. I was a year out of college. I had gone to college for five years because it took me a while to figure out what my major was going to be. I started as a music major. No one uh, no one knows why. And then I switched to theater and no one really knew why then either. I called my parents the night before class started of my sophomore year. And I said, Mom and Dad, I, I want to change my major. Well, I'm sure they wondered, what is he, you know, what is it with this guy? But uh, they took it well. And so four years of, of uh, theater school at the University of Oklahoma. I grew up in Oklahoma City. And then I took a year to save not enough money. And then I was I was off to New York. I'd come to New York on a school-sponsored visit in my fourth year. Either That's either my first senior year or my second junior year, depending on how you want to look at it. <laughs> I've never given New York any thought growing up. But now, you know, I'm pursuing a, a theater degree. And I think, well, I've got to go to New York or LA, right? I mean, that's where you go as an actor. They're in the first place I got to visit was New York. Again, I'd never given New York a Thought. I'd never thought, oh, I just wish I could go to New York someday. Never crossed my mind. Wow. But the first day here, it just grabbed me. And we went to see The Elephant Man on Broadway. Bruce Davison was was starring in it. Afterwards, we got to do a little visit backstage. And I was just taken with all of it. All of it. Went to the improv to see comedy. So I spoke to my parents late that night on the phone, just checking in the way you do when you're a college student on the road. And I told them, I knew this wouldn't happen, but I said, if someone offered me a job during this visit, I would accept it and quit school and stay here. I mean, I was sold the first day and we barely left Times Square. What? It's not like I experienced <laughs> all the rich uh, blessings and, and offerings of New York. I, I just, I was hooked. And in June of 19th, the day after Father's Day, I stayed in Oklahoma City for Father's Day. And the day after I was off to New York and have been here ever since. I am sitting in back right now and I'm just kind of in awe. It is kind of like that narrative and like I, in my mind, with so many amazing, incredible details at the right here at the beginning. But in my mind, I'm like 1982. And I'm guessing that first trip was maybe like 1980 or something. Times Square. Uh, and everything I've ever heard was that was like such a terrible neighborhood at that time. And so like crime ridden and like, but you was came and you're like, this is great. <laughs> yeah. You know, I guess it was, but we, I didn't see it that way. And we would go to the right. and and stay late watching all the comics. We didn't experience anything out toward you know, it, it went okay, but it might well not have. I guess we got a little bit lucky, you know. Yeah, I mean, I guess you're just in awe and taken by it. Like you were saying, you're like, I never even thought I I can live in New York. Like, who knew? So then when you finally come in 1982, the day after Father's Day, did you have some sort of job lined up in our apartment or did no, you just? No, no. Yeah. I worked at, at a restaurant in Oklahoma City all through college. It was called Molly Murphy's House of Fine Repute. And it was a crazy restaurant. The, the decor was nuts just a, a, a really wacky restaurant <laughs> so when i came here i thought well i have experience at a very busy restaurant i can handle anything in new york but i found when you got to new york in the restaurant business if you didn't have new york experience it didn't matter what you'd done anywhere else yeah so i couldn't get a waiter job right away so i scooped ice cream at a sedudo's ice cream parlor i don't know if there are anymore but there were a few in the city then it was a small chain it was unair conditioned i hate the summer so i'm scooping ice cream nice and cold on my arms but up here i'm dying and for minimum wage just next to it was a hamburger joint called diane's old-timer new york's new yorkers will know these two places sedudo's and diane's right next to each other owned by the same person so i got a promotion to work at Diane's, but not as a waiter, as a dishwasher. And the only thing that was promotion about it, it didn't make any more money. I just got air conditioning. That's all I got. <laughs> but eventually, eventually I got a waiter job, you know, and I was on my way at least financially. This is what almost playing into what we were saying at the beginning. It's like, things really don't change that much. Actually, it's like the dynamics of it might have, but let, everyone knows that when you first arrive and you're like scraping by and you, you're trying to put together a paycheck and trying to make your rent and all of these things. It, it is just so interesting though, that you like name dropping all these spots that of course I've never heard of. I would say, you know, I didn't know anything about New York in the 1980s. I love <laughs> hearing these things that you're like, oh, every, every Upper West Sider would know these. They would remember these. And it's just well, like- older yes. ones, older ones. Yes, yeah. it's this, it's just this nugget of this time of New York that is just so great to hear about. And of course, the second question is, why did you move to New York? And for you, obviously, if it were like saying you like studied theater, but like you were saying, you you kind of like the option was New York or LA or, or you didn't even know you could move to New York. So you come, you have this trip, 
what really is the answer of why did you move to New York? Well, I moved here to pursue acting. Yeah. And millions of actors can say it didn't work out for me there. But it was in, in part, I was intimidated by the whole process. And I found when I first moved here, I think I'm, I hate to say it, but I think I really may have been depressed. I mean, I really wanted to come here, but I never really did conquer my nervousness and my fear of auditioning and just my general cluelessness about a, how to proceed. You know, they say, well, you mail out headshots and resumes and you have, mail out postcards and you got to do that constantly. And I'm like, to who? <laughs> I, I don't, I, you know, I didn't even, re and I'm sure there's a simple, and now it would be easier. You could learn a lot online. If, right, know, right, 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 right. This was 1982, 83. But I'm hearing this and I'm like, but you stay, stay. even through all of it. I mean, like, you've lived here for, yeah. I mean, what are we at here? Like It'll be 40 years next month. Yeah. And for years, you're kind of saying like, well, I didn't know what I was doing, but you stayed like anybody, yeah. like the, you, there's a, a litany of people we could say who left six months in because they couldn't figure it out and you've made it work. I think that's the most interesting and exciting part about all of this is even if you hear this and you come here and of course we all get down and it's hard, but like 40 years later, here you are, Brett. <laughs> well. Thank you for for saying so. And it's true. But I would say for that first decade, I, I was a little bit aimless. Very few people managed to actually achieve their plans. Right. I'm not kicking myself over it, you know, so no regrets at all. Yeah. I was hooked on New York. Things didn't exactly pan out as you wanted, but like we said, it has worked out. It's been 40 years and that your love for New York and all of these opportunities is what has kept you here. And, and considering that you have stayed for 40 years I think now I need to ask you the most important question of the show. And that is, of course, Brett, what is the most fun you've ever had in New York City? Well, now, I, this is a story I love to tell. So if I get too long-winded, you feel free to edit it. <laughs> I published a book in 2000, a book of humorous essays and stories. It's called Men My Mother Dated and Other Mostly True Tales. And the front half of the book was stories inspired by my mom's youthful romantic exploits. Ooh. When you're a kid, you think your parents were always married. And then... At some point, you realize, oh, no, they must have dated, you know, and then you ask for some stories about that. And my mom had some great ones, some funny ones. <laughs> so I'm working at BarnesandNoble.com, and we used to switch subject areas a little bit. I was an editor there, and so for a while, I was overseeing the art section. Annie Leibovitz had a new book coming out called Women, and it was celebrating all the aspects of women and their accomplishments. It, you know, there are a few beautiful women in it, but that wasn't the point of the book. It was the accomplishments of women. And I was genuinely very excited. I thought this sounded like a great, great book. So I was looking forward to it. And it was a few months away. And we got a notification that Random House wanted a few of the corporate buyers at Barnes & Noble and me as the art editor on the website to come visit Annie in her studio and see the book in progress. Wow. Of course, we went. So we go to her studio. She has the book spread out like just prints and rows and rows of pictures across the floor. And they're only a, a few inches apart. And we're tiptoeing them among them. And she says, ah, oh, they're just fiery prints. To this day, I don't know what a fiery print is, but apparently it's not the fanciest of prints. Don't worry about stepping it. So she didn't care if we stepped on these beautiful photographs or we just couldn't. I mean, we were tiptoeing between them. Where is her studio? Her studio was downtown. Okay. So area, I think. I wish I remembered exactly where. Okay. She clearly wasn't all that thrilled about having us there. I'm sure the publisher put pressure. Just let them come in for an hour or two. You know, they'll buy more books from us that way and you'll sell more, you know, and whatever. But she she wasn't hiding very well the fact that she had better things to do than to put up with us. She wasn't <laughs> rude, just kind of aloof. And so I'm I'm loving what I'm seeing. The photographs are just amazing. I, I'm more sold on this project than ever. And she's over there with this kind of glower, doesn't really want us there. But I thought, you know, and I don't mean to make a direct connection here or comparison, but I thought, what if all those years ago I was in Vincent Van Gogh's studio and he was over in the corner being weird? Am I going to just stay away from him or am I going to go speak to him? Yeah. So I thought I'm going to go speak to her. And if she really makes it clear she's not into it, talking to me, I will scurry away. I'm not going to make a jerk of myself. But I go over and I express sincere enthusiasm about the project. As it turns out, I learned later she was a little nervous about the project. So the fact that I was so genuinely, I wasn't blowing smoke, genuinely enthusiastic about it and asking really interesting questions, she said. So as we completed our visit, I said, you know, I'm the art editor at, at dot com and I would sure love to interview you when it gets closer to the publication date. And she says, okay. I think that means, okay, yeah, check with my people. Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. But no, she meant okay. So when I checked back with her people, they said, yes, she has you on her list of interviews. She only did, I learned later, four interviews for that book. And I, you know, was one of them. Whoa. 
So when I go to the interview, she says, oh, I've been looking forward to seeing you. It's, it's some months, some weeks later, you know, I've been looking forward to seeing you. And I said, you have? <laughs> you know, I just, I assume she wouldn't even remember meeting me. You know, how many people did she meet in a week? And she goes, yeah. She said, you asked such interesting questions and you were so enthusiastic about the book. And I was nervous about it. And I said, well, I love the book and, and thank you so much. So I had about 60 questions printed out, have tons of backup, but I always prefer just to converse much as you and I are doing. And that's exactly what it was. She and I just talked. Anyway, it was just a wonderful hour long, maybe 90 minute conversation, very casual, sitting at a picnic table in her studio. So my book was coming out in six months or so. So as we're wrapping up, I'm like rolling up my microphone cord and so forth. I say, I have to ask, I said, since we're both with the Random House, do you offer a discount to random fellow Random House authors? As if, yeah, yeah, 10% to random house authors off my $50,000 fee. You, you, right. know? you know, I meant, I meant it as a joke. But sometimes you make a joke and some kind of weird hope that they'll respond a certain way. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. She said, you need an author photo? Well, let's do it. <gasps> and she didn't mean right then. We it She she said, talk to, and I'm, I'm ashamed to say I don't remember the assistant's name. Talk to my assistant. She'll get you set up. And I was like, oh, my God. I'm <laughs> and she said, now, it won't be one of my fancy ones without, you know, all the bells and whistles. It'll be a simple shot. But absolutely, let's do it. Whoa. My agent's beside herself. I call my editor. She's beside herself. But my editor calls me back. She says, Brett, are you sure this is, like, free? Because she said, we give you $300 for a photo. That's your budget for an author photo. You know, if any of this is going to charge more than three hundred dollars which we know she would charge many 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 times that then we know we got to pull the plug on this right now so i called her system back and i said i'm really embarrassed to have to ask this but and she said here's the deal when it's a paid gig she hands the all the arrangements to her agent when it's not she hands it to me and she's handed this to me so you don't have to worry so okay. absolutely free whoa, whoa. so <laughs> And I, it's funny, I, I joked about this a lot in the weeks leading up to our actual appointment because they had to, we made an appointment, they had to cancel because she got a paid gig. We made another appointment, they had to cancel because something came up. And I thought, I am not meant to have my photo taken by any Leibovitz for free. I mean, I'm watching for runaway buses, falling safes out of windows, you know, anything that might go wrong. And I'm joking about it with my friends, but I'm only half joking. It really does feel like I've got to survive. Right. And I did. And it was so great. And when I got there, and I don't have any great clothes, but I took whatever I had. And as I get there, Annie comes out. She has a bunch of assistants in the front room. And as she comes out, she's a, a tall woman. She's taller than me. And she goes, I'll bet you're a nervous wreck. And she takes me in a big bear hug and kind of shakes me up and down. She oh goes, my I'm sure you're nervous. Don't be nervous. It's This is going to be fun. So I went with an assistant, picked out some clothes among my shabby offerings and she says let's start outside we'll shoot outside for a while and then we'll come back in and shoot inside and we're shooting on the street and she has people holding those giant reflectors you know that photographers use and she has a couple of guys with lights she has a stylist who's like making my hair just so and putting the scarf just so around my neck and i asked the stylist do you work for annie because no i work with her often but you know it's a freelance base she hires me when she needs me i said so annie's paying you and she said, yes. Oh, my. Wow. 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 So wow. Annie brought in a stylist on her own dime for a, a free gig. She's given me the gift of this shoot. And she paid money to her stylist, too. I'm sure it wasn't cheap. The uh, stylist fluttered around me. It was just fixing. Every two or three shots, she'd come in and adjust things and fix my hair or whatever. You're a star. And the people drove by because we're out on the street. And I'm sure they're thinking, oh, look, this is some kind of fancy shoot. And they're looking at me and they're going, well, who's that? You know, because I'm absolutely nobody is who I am. Just a great moment. It was just a yeah. Great, everything about it was great. So we get back to the studio and she goes, I'm looking at these pictures and they're great. And, and I had a little goatee then. I didn't have a mustache. She goes, I like your goatee. It looks great. But why don't we shave it and shoot some more? And I mean, if she had said, you know, why don't we lop off your left arm and shoot some more? I would have said, yes. Yes, by all means, my left arm, I don't need it. Take it off. But so she sent an assistant out to get shaving supplies. I go in and shave and we shop for like another hour inside. It was just unbelievable. And as we're wrapping up, now women is out. She's got stacks of women in, in the studio. And I said, my mom is so excited that I'm working with you today. And she's so grateful that you're doing this lovely thing for me. If I buy women, can I come back in and, and have you sign it to my mother? And she goes, don't be ridiculous. She goes and gets this $80 book. She brings it over and what's your mom's name? My mom's name was Karen. She says, to Karen, 
Thank you for sharing your wonderful son with me, Annie Leibovitz. Oh. Well, my mom, you can imagine, she cried her eyes out when she got that book. You know, I mean, such a lovely thing to say. Wow. So two or three days later, I'm at work and a messenger brings a big packet to me. And I don't know what it is, but we get books and stuff. You know, I don't know. I'm, and it was a life changing experience to look at those images. When I look at myself in the mirror, I don't think I'm any kind of, even then, I was more handsome then, I'm a little older now, any kind of great, you know, terribly handsome guy, but not so bad. You know, just kind of a nice, friendly, open face. And he somehow captured the me that I saw in the see in the mirror. It wasn't a glam shot. You don't have any trouble recognizing it as me. You know, sometimes people get a shot and they look so nice. You're like, well, who is? It? Oh, wait, I know who that is, but that doesn't look like them. It was me. They were all me, the perfect version of me. And I, I took my stack of pictures over to a female buddy of mine at work and I popped them down on her desk and I said, now you look at those and you tell me why I'm still single. <laughs> she didn't have an answer, but she thought it was funny. The amazing thing about the whole experience is just how fun it was. There may be a handful of other cities in the world where something that magical could happen. I owe it to New York. And this whole story is so incredible. And I feel like the word that you use that's so perfect is magical. It is this thing that like, I love the way you're saying it, it was like magical that New York could do this for you because you're in those rooms. It's just like the things we were talking about. Like you're in that room and you get to, you know, whether it's a joke or a half joke and you say, um, well, I need a, I need an author's photo. And I like, I don't know, obviously I know who Annie Leibovitz is, but I don't have any thoughts of her or about her. And I just, the whole time I'm like, wow, who knew she was so kind and giving and, and incredible. She took that opportunity to take someone that you're saying is like, you know, I wasn't some famous movie star or something. And she truly made you feel so special and out on the street and you've got this stuff. I just like, I'm like, oh my God, Amy, Annie Leibovitz, like what a very, very giving, giving person. It feels so cool to be this guy that maybe, okay, the acting didn't work out or whatever, but you found that you had this one little day roaming around with this celebrity artist and you felt great and magical. It is so fun. It's great. Yes. Annie Leibovitz, who knew? Like, she's like a <laughs> wonderful woman. All right. <laughs> Considering that great monumental magical story, all of your time spent in New York, I have to ask you the last question of the show. That is, what is your favorite thing about New York? It's really the diversity. I love that there are people from everywhere. You know, the fact that you can eat food from all over the world here. How many museums do we have? I don't know. I, I wish I'd looked it up. I, I let you and your listeners know, and I'm sorry. But <laughs> just the utter diversity of things to do, of people to meet, of food to eat, of music to listen to, the diversity in every sense. I love that. I think it's one of the best things about New York. It's something that all of us love. I love the way you're saying that it plays into every sort of field, whether it be culinary or, or you know, art or whatever. It's the diversity, all of these people here. It's just such a great place to live. And I think we see that just full stop of the time you have spent here and you could have left, but you have stayed. Brett, thank you so much for being on the show, for telling us all of your New York stories, for staying in New York. It means a tremendous amount to me. Thank you. Oh, it's my great pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Most of all, thanks, New York. They had fun.